Our reading for this morning is from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It is good to see you. This has been an, a busy week and a busy weekend for Memorial Road. We had a number of people over this weekend uh, providing a service and care to the homeless in our community. There is a lot going on in this church. And we are in a series on the church, and I'm grateful for Phil's invitation to spend some time with you looking at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be talking about what the church is, what it means to us, and specifically Paul's letter to a young minister named Timothy. So if you would open your Bibles back to where we just were, where Mitch was reading. We're going to start there, and I want to read this one more time, because we have a letter written specifically for Timothy. We're going to get into his life in just a moment. And we're going to get into the author of 1 Timothy's life in just a moment. But I want to look specifically at verses 14 and verse 15, where it says, Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So I want to look at a couple of things, and I want to start off by looking at the life of Paul. If I receive a letter, I want to know who wrote it. I want to know something about them. I want to know uh, why should I listen to their thoughts? What is it about them that would make them credible so that I can have a sense of is this important to me or not? So I want to have an introduction to Paul. I want to tell you a few things about his life so that you can have a sense of why Paul's letter is so important to Timothy, this young minister trying to do God's will. A few things about Paul. The first thing that I think would be helpful for you to know is that Paul was a Jew. Paul was a Jew, and matter of fact, when we talk about Paul, you'll find that he uses two different names. He uses the name Saul when he's talking to his Jewish friends and family. And then he uses the name Paul when he is talking to his Gentile friends and family. For most of his life, he is going to be known as Saul. But from the point that we're going to be talking about today on forward, most people will refer to him as Paul because he is going to be spending more and more of his life with people who would be more familiar with that name than the one that he would have had when he began with his Jewish community. So he was a Jew. He was born around the same time of, as Jesus, and he was raised in Jerusalem, and we'll get into that in just a moment, but I want you to know something about him. Number one, he was a Jew. Number two, he was a Roman citizen. At a time in which being a Roman citizen gave you unique privileges in life. Paul was born in Tarsus. Tarsus was a free city recognized by Rome. And so he was born into this privilege of being a Roman citizen. You could become a Roman citizen in three ways. One, you could be born into it. Second, you could purchase it for a high price. And the third option would be that you could earn it by years of service in the military. Paul was born into it. So he's a Roman citizen. Number three, he was highly educated in the law. 
His teacher was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was one of the most respected leaders of his time. Gamaliel was one of the key leaders in the Sanhedrin, which was a very select group of influential leaders and rabbis who were the kind that people listened to in difficult times and in times of uncertainty. Gamaliel taught Paul, and he was a good student. Paul was part of the group that was known as the Pharisees. He also was a learned man. He would have studied the Old Testament in Hebrew. He would have been able to speak Koine Greek, which was the common Greek of the time. He also spoke Aramaic. Paul was a man that was in a community in which he belonged. He was in a community where people understood him. He understood them. They had a good sense of who they were, what they were trying to accomplish. And Paul's life was on a trajectory of success. Continue on with it. Not only was he highly educated as in the law, he was deeply committed to persecuting the church. So you have Paul, this man who is completely devoted to his faith. And because of his faith, he is now looking at this new group that has emerged in his lifetime that is threatening what he knows and loves. And because of this, Paul has decided it is his responsibility to take what he can do to intimidate, to persecute the church. And he is doing this, he is persecuting the church without any question in his mind that what he is doing is right. I want you to imagine his life because he has been trained in the right places. He has grown up in the right places. He has the right credentials and he is finding success in his life. He is committed fully to his faith. And then Paul has an encounter. Paul's life was changed forever based on a single encounter with Jesus. Now here's the question I would like to ask you as we start moving into this thought today. Do you believe that your entire life can be changed in a single conversation at the right time? Do you believe that your entire life can be changed in a single conversation at the right time? Do you believe that that kind of moment could even happen on a day like this one? So Paul has received permission. He has received a charge and a blessing to persecute the church and he is on his way to Damascus to do so. When we find him in Acts chapter 22, I want you to see what's happening in Paul's life that changes it forever. Look at Acts chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 1 and make our way through to verse 16. It says this. Paul writes, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as many of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So here we enter the story of Paul. He is on his way to Damascus with the blessing of God's people in his mind. He believes something with his entire heart, without question. He is convinced of his rightness. He is convinced that what he is doing is good and true. And he's on his way to Damascus to do what he believes is God's will. And as he is doing this, about noon, he said, about noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light 
from heaven flashed around me. This is not something that happens on a normal day. He is on his way to Damascus. His adrenaline is flowing. He can see the city. He is there to do this thing. And unexpectedly, as he is making his way to Damascus, he is then surrounded by light. This is an unusual moment. So Paul fell to the ground. And so this man of great intimidation, this man of great persuasive power, this man who thought of himself as a zealot, is now shielded by light with dirt in his face. And in this moment, He will be forever changed when he hears this. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now what's interesting is that in several different places throughout the Bible, Paul is going to say this, I persecuted the way, I persecuted the church, I persecuted the Christians, I persecuted these people. And what's interesting is that Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says this, Paul, you are persecuting me. My companions and saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. Now look at what he says there. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand of Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. And then a man named Ananias came to see him. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He was a lot like Paul. And this man who understood Paul, who understood the life that Paul had been leading, this man says to him, this highly respected man, he says, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. I want you to know who Paul is. Paul is a man who did not begin with an understanding of what God really wanted him to do. And he believed what he was doing was true. And this is the thing. We can believe things that aren't true, and we do so all the time. And so what do we do when we are seeking the truth? And what Jesus did for Paul is what Jesus does for us. He confronted Paul in a moment, and he gave him truth. And Paul responded. So it's that Paul that writes to Timothy. So let me tell you just a little bit about Timothy, then we'll get into the the core of this concept. So if I want to know more about Timothy, Timothy came from a family that was both Jewish, his mother was a Jewess, and from a family that was Greek. His father was Greek. This would have made Timothy's life very challenging. Because Timothy lived in a home that was really thinking in two different directions. So Timothy was born a Jew, but he was not circumcised. And I can only assume it was because his father was not okay with that. So he lives in these two different worlds. And I would have to imagine he looks at his life and wonders, why do I have to do it this way? Why am I put in this spot? So he came from a family that had both a Jewish and a Greek background Second would be Timothy's legacy of faith came through his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice. This morning, as 
Dante was leading our songs when we started singing, I come to the garden alone, I'm sitting on the front row, and I was thinking to myself of that song, and the voice I heard was the voice of my mother singing alto. It is a voice I hear in my mind's eye because that voice was the voice growing up all those years. She would sing that song, singing alto, and it's in my heart and in my head. And, and, and what you find with Timothy is he had a mother, Eunice, and a grandmother, Lois, that were part of his faith formation too. So in a world that was divided, he found his way through his family. And then finally this, Timothy understood that ministry required commitment. He was from Lystra. Now this was an interesting place because Paul had come to that city in his first missionary journey. Paul had come through Timothy's hometown. And when Paul came through Timothy's hometown, his reception was negative. He was uh, speaking to the groups, he and Barnabas, he was speaking to the people there, he was making some progress, and then some Jews who were just like Paul, came from two other cities, came to Lystra with intent to silence this man. And they were successful. They find Paul. They stone Paul. They throw rocks upon Paul until they believe that he is dead. They believe he is dead. They then drag his body outside of the city, rejoicing that they had done God's will. And Paul was not dead, revived, got back to his feet, walked back into the city. Next day, he would move on to the next town. Now, I'm saying this to you because Lois and Eunice would have known what happened Timothy may have been in the crowd watching Paul endure this. Timothy knew the price of ministry. Timothy was not blind to what it was going to take to do a great thing. It was going to require great commitment. It was going to require the kind of commitment that requires a greater faith. And what you'll find in many people's lives is that the reason their faith is no longer growing is because they are not doing things that require greater faith. And Timothy, in this moment, is looking at the life of Paul. And then Paul comes back to Lystra on his second missionary journey. And that's where he says to Timothy, join me and be a part of this ministry. The two have endured great hardships together. And I would ask you the question, why? Why would they do this? Why would they be willing to endure these hardships? Why were they willing to do so much when they seemed to receive so little? So let's go back to the heart of this, which is 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. I want you to hear this because I want you to, to imagine what's being said here and then put this on, try this on for size. If this is true, what does it mean? It says, although I hope, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. Now look at the key idea. The key of this moment, which is embedded in this larger book, this letter to Timothy, is this. God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And here's the question. Is the church, is the church the place where I can find the truth? Is that a true statement? So as Paul is writing Timothy, Timothy, Timothy is listening to the voice of this man he trusts, and, and Paul is writing Timothy without the benefit of an experience. Paul is writing Timothy knowing exactly the price that it will cost for Timothy to be an effective minister. 
Let me tell you right now. I don't know that we fully understand how grateful we should be to have a preacher like Phil. There has been no time in history where it's easy to be in ministry, but this is a particularly challenging time. Do you realize how grateful we should be to have someone like Phil th being in this pulpit? Do you realize how difficult it is to be an elder trying to navigate what the truth is for all time using the Bible today in a time of great division? I'll tell you what, the people who stood up here a moment ago as our elders making decisions behind the scenes with a specific goal in mind, God let us understand and know and do your will based upon what is true do you realize how much of a gift it is to have elders who are willing to pursue the truth even when it's out of step at times with the sensibilities of our culture and time? It is a gift. Now, if this is to be true, often people will say this, well, that may be true, but it's not been true in my life. The church has been the source of the problem. I've heard people say this, I love Jesus, I just don't like the church. And I understand the sentiment, but I would ask you not to say that again. Because the church is the bride of Christ, and let's look at it, because Paul is not writing to Timothy without an understanding of what's going on. I've got to tell you up front, I grew up in a great church. My dad was in ministry. I saw the brutality of ministry, and I loved the church. I watched my parents go through hard times because of the church, but because of the church, the hard times were worth it. But I grew up in a church that was amazing. I grew up in a church that was committed to defeating the, the hungry and caring for the poor, that was focused on what did the Bible say. It was a grace-filled, Bible-believing church, and it was unbelievable. I grew up in the era we had joy buses. Remember the joy buses? Well, our church, we had 10 of them. And we broke every law possible because we had over 100 kids in those buses. Those buses were incredible. We would load the, the, the buses up with the kids from all the neighborhoods, and we'd be singing those songs, Blue Skies and Rainbows. And the windows were down, and the entire neighborhood got to hear those kids screaming at the top of their lungs, and it was an incredible time. And, and I went to this church that was about it. My mother, the, the, the teacher for our second grade Sunday school class, she and one other woman, I remember her standing on top of a table because there were 120 second graders and two teachers. I didn't say it worked well, I just said it was exciting. <laughs> what an amazing place! What an amazing place! Now, I'm saying this to you because I want you to understand that was where I began to know about Jesus and know about what was going on. And then it would be later on the mission trip. My parents are, are, are likely watching this this morning from Guatemala. First time they've been able to go back since COVID. But I remember when my dad took me to Guyana when I was 14 to teach people about Jesus, took me back when I was 16. And when we were, when I was 16 years old, I was in the hospital there in Georgetown, Guyana, and, and dad had a passion for children who had no one to care for them. And there were all of these children who had been left at the hospital who were HIV positive, who had no one to hold them. And dad said, what would Jesus do? And he said, what we ought to do is go to the hospital and we would sit on the rocking chairs and rock those babies to sleep. That is the church. The compassion of the church is needed more now than ever. The love of God's people is needed now more than ever. But I want to be clear with you. The church has been under attack, but the church is the greatest hope for humankind. 
It is time for us to reclaim the definition of what it means to be the church. And the church is the place where I can learn the truth. And you say, but yeah, you don't understand. The church is the place that wounded me. Well, let's look at 1 Timothy. Let me tell you what he's writing to Timothy about. 1 Timothy chapter 1 is about the early church which had trouble discerning the truth. Chapter 1 of 1 Timothy is about false teachers. And boy, do we have a lot of them right now. My brother-in-law, who I love and respect dearly, he is a good and godly man, was born, born with a cleft lip, cleft palate, and because of that, he had a passion for health care and became a nurse. And one of the things that he loves to do is to go around the world and provide that type of care to rebuild people's cleft lip and palate as part of a ministry. It's something that he is great at. A few years ago, he went to China to do the same thing. And so he went there, was there for a few weeks, and on the way back, he picked up a, a jacket for me for Christmas. This jacket, if you, don't, if you know me, I, I, I love to hike. I love to go to national parks and spend time hiking. I know I don't look like a hiker, but I hike slow, and so I love it. But he bought me this jacket, and it was a North Face jacket. And it said, Professional Series. And he gave me this jacket, and I put it on, and I was like, man, this is really cool. North Face jacket. And I, and I noticed a few things when I put it on. First thing I noticed when I put it on is that I began to lose feeling in my hands because the elastic was so tight. And I thought, that's kind of weird. You would think that North Face would have that figured out. So I had to cut the elastic so I could, you know, use my hands. Then I was looking for the pockets, and there were no pockets in this jacket except for way up here, which didn't fit, you know? I thought, that's weird that they don't have pockets. Then I noticed it was a lot shinier than other people's jackets, and I wore it to church one morning, and I was looking at somebody in front of me who had a North Face jacket on, and I was looking at mine, and I noticed the lettering was a little bit off. So I actually went online. I typed in the name of the jacket, and this is crazy. This was evidently a limited edition because it wasn't even on their website. <laughs> now what happened? My brother-in-law, who is a great guy, bought a counterfeit North Face jacket for me for Christmas. Now I'm saying this to you because it would not be fair for me to judge North Face jacket quality based upon a counterfeit North Face jacket. When you find yourself upset with what the church is, not only is that not wrong, it is good and right, but let us not blame the real thing for the actions and attitudes of the counterfeit. So what happens? We've got false teachers who will say whatever you want to hear. We have people who will profit from spiritual manipulation. 1 Timothy 1 is about discerning the truth. What do we do with these false teachers? 1 Timothy 2 is about worship style issues. Good thing 2,000 years later we got it figured out. What Timothy is receiving is a letter that is incredibly valuable today. Now imagine being an elder in this church. And you've got people who come to you and say, I don't know about this scripture or about that scripture. And, and they've come to you and, and they're saying, this is what I think we should do. And you are trying to decide what is true that could be applied in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It could also be applied in Vienna. It could also be applied in Rwanda. It could also be applied in Australia. And it also could be truthly, the truth would be true whether we were talking about 1700 or 2300. 
And what we can easily do is make the church match a Western philosophy versus the church matching God's will. So how do you decide the truth? You go to the source of the truth. Now people say today that the source of truth has moved from, from the church, from the Bible, to science. And let me be clear here. There's something that Alexander Campbell said one time to a young John Muir. John Muir was deeply impacted by the life of Campbell. And he said this to him. He said, God and science never disagree. Science is not the enemy. The question about the church's validity is not necessarily about our beliefs. Often it is about our actions. The church had challenges with, it worship, with worship style in 1 Timothy 2. In 1 Timothy 3, the early church had leadership challenges. So Paul provides a sketch. This is what an elder should look like. This is what a deacon should be. These are the roles that should be considered. Chapter 5, early church had differences in opinion about ministry, how it should be done. 1 Timothy 6 was about social justice issues. So what do we do? What do we do when we realize that the church was struggling with the same things then in some ways as we are now? Look at the last one. 1 Timothy chapter 6 also looks at the dishonest and difficult people in the midst of the church. So what do we do? What do we do with the church? And I'm going to ask you to consider three things very quickly here. Number one, I would ask you to consider this. I would ask you to choose to love the church. I would ask you to choose to love the church. If Jesus loved the church, then we should love the church. And I ask you to choose that because it's not always easy. Number two, I'm going to ask for you to renew your commitment to the church. To renew your commitment to the church. To dream again about what it could be. To dream again about where we're going and and what could be done. To, To renew the commitment. And then finally, I'd ask you this. Do what you can to make things right at home. If the church is God's household, there are times when families have to make things right, where there has to be a reconciliation, where we have to draw new lines, where we have to give people some grace. I know it's true for me. I know without question I've hurt people in this church, both intentionally and unintentionally. I know that there are people in this church who have hurt me, both intentionally and unintentionally. And I'm saying this, at some point we recognize, yes, but we are family. And in God's household, what are we going to do? We're going to do the best that we can. But I would say this. If we do life together very long, we will give each other reasons to question one another. And I find that the presence of Jesus changes things. Last fight my brother and I got into, we were in the living room, and he was wrong about something. And we began to push each other. And my mother stood in between the two of us and she put her hands out and she's a small woman and she put her hands out on our chests and said, stop it. What does Jesus do for us? Love the church. Renew your commitment. And be quick to erase the past that is keeping the past from allowing the present to emerge. May God bless you. If it is time for you to make things right, 
in this household, if you are ready to commit again, if you want something more than just a church to attend, but a household that you can be a part of, if you are seeking the truth and you hear the voice of Jesus saying to you, this is not the way and you want to make it right, you have never been in a more supportive room than this one right now. And if we can serve you, we would invite you to come forward now as we stand and sing this song.